Well, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome people back. This, um, as, our, as our panelists are getting ready, um, this is our last session of the afternoon, although of course we will reconvene tomorrow, and we're really excited about a very special panel. Let me just give folks a moment to get seated. And so to uh, start us off this afternoon, um, I am delighted to introduce Michael Barr, who is the Dean of the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, he, it, this panel is a little different, as you'll hear from the others, because it is less focused on research and really focused on the wide range of ways that, through careers, you can have an impact on public policy. And Michael has had an impact on public policy through academia, but also through his role in community engagement and in public service. And so it's really an honor to invite him just to say a few words to the group before we launch the panel. Michael? Thank you so much, Susan, and um, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, as Susan said, I'm the um, uh, dean of the Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, Susan um, was my predecessor as dean of the Ford School of Public Policy, and um, I will um, be thanking Susan in lots of um, ways uh, in just a moment, but I, I'll just start by uh, thanking Susan for uh, leaving me an institution so strong and vibrant as the Ford School. I feel super, uh, just really blessed. Um, sometimes deans come into institutions and they have lots of hard work to do inside the uh, institution um, to strengthen it. And I just feel um, I have been uh, given a blessed gift um, from Susan, so I'm very thankful um, for, for that. Um, the Ford School is um, very honored to be among the co-sponsors for this symposium. We're grateful to the university's Bicentennial Committee, uh, which provided generous funding for the event and for the wonderful partnership that we've had with the Institute for Social Research. Uh, David and uh, Susan worked uh, intimately together on this, as well as the uh, Alumni Association and other campus units. Um, you've been hearing about uh, the amazing um, contributions of Michigan graduates um, all over the world in um, uh, providing um, and deepening our understanding um, of and addressing and working on problems of inequality across a broad range of domains. Uh, health, education, uh, poverty, economic mobility, gender, race. Uh, it turns out if you look around the world at the top think tanks, uh, the top universities, the top government agencies, the top nonprofits, um, really all over, there are University of Michigan scholars and professionals um, front and center working on these issues. And that proud tradition extends back for decades. Um, I was at a um, uh, conference in September we organized here at the University of Michigan on behavioral finance. Uh, and our keynote speaker was Bob Scheller, the Nobel laureate uh, Yale economist. And Bob was um, one of the founders of the field of behavioral finance. And he gave a really a quite wonderful lecture um, about narratives in economic history. But before he started his formal remarks, he gave what I can only describe as a love song to the University of Michigan. Um, the rich and um, uh, deep tradition here at the university of uh, the strongest, um, most interesting interdisciplinary research, uh, people working across uh, departments and fields uh, to generate a deeper understanding of problems in the real world and then to act on them. And that tradition is uh, very much alive and well today. Uh, as Susan mentioned, um, the next panel, which uh, Susan really conceived and developed, uh, is um, uh, different from the other panels you've heard today. Uh, the panel is uh, composed of people who are graduates of the University of Michigan, um, who are in the world um, in a wide variety of um, uh, fields and with a wide variety of skills, uh, using their training here at the University of Michigan to make a difference. And um, uh, I am uh, very much looking forward to the panel. Um, 
uh, deeply grateful um, to Susan um, for organizing this panel and to Susan and David for their partnership in organizing this symposium. It really is uh, just an extraordinary event and um, could not have had, uh, happened without um, their uh, great and strong uh, work and partnership together, uh, which is again a hallmark of the way in which University of Michigan uh, units and departments operate. So uh, with that, I am pleased to introduce um, the moderator for this panel, uh, Michigan Radio's program director and host of the show, It's Just Politics. Uh, please um, join me in thanking Susan and David and in welcoming Zoe, who will introduce the, um, the whole panel. In radio, so I should I should know how to use these things. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to see faces out here, and it's really, really wonderful uh, to see the five people here who who are on my right. I uh, have spent the past few days uh, getting to know each of them. Don't worry; it sounds a little a little creepy, but I feel like I know each of you very closely now. And I really believe, like, if I was stuck in a room or had a really big problem, these five folks are folks that I would want. Uh, as my brain trust, no kidding. Like it feels like, remember that um, that show, Planet America or Captain America, and each person had a superpower and they would go together to save the world. I kid you not. Each person here has, I think, their own superpower. Um, with that said, I am not going to read bios out loud today. That is one of my least favorite things to do. I think it's so much richer uh, to hear from folks directly how they want to be represented. Um, so I'm going to go down the line, and I am totally stealing this from New York Public Library. I am a journalist, so I say when I've stolen something else. Um, and I'm going to have folks describe themselves in, in three words, uh, rather than what it necessarily means in their profile or their bios, but how they see themselves. So I'm going to start to my right with Carmen Harlan. Hi, Zoe. Hi, Carmen. Put you on the spot. You're usually the, you're usually the one asking the tough questions. Usually, but I will take tough questions today. I'm talkative. In fact, I, I was nicknamed Motormouth when I was young and uh, uh, loud sometimes. <laughs> and I, I think I have, I think I'm funny. I really do. I think I have a wonderful <laughs> sense of humor. And it served me well throughout my years in television <laughs> and radio first. And that is true. I will say, having been born and raised in Ann Arbor, Carmen was like everything to me. And I will tell you, people at WDIV call her the queen. And I know for a fact that like she treats them with such amazing dignity. Young journalists who grew up and just watching you, wanting to be you. And I have heard just the best, best things about what it was like. And at they're WDIV. all true. And they're all true. <laughs> and, that, and that she was incredibly funny, too, was the other thing that they said. Lejeune Montgomery, Tabron, welcome. Thank you. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Okay, your three words. So my three words would be passionate, uh -huh. committed, steward. And that really is the story of my life. Oh. oh. Right. I know, really hearty. Do you want to pass and, and just we'll come back I, to you? How many are you ready? How lifelines do I get? <laughs> um, hmm. Okay. I've got a conspiratorial, Ooh. dogged hustler. Oh, wow. Those my are... mother's watching this go, I paid for that. Uh huh. Um, that's uh huh. What I I like it. So hearty view. I didn't get to get the full, the full before he was ready to go. Um, Cecilia, hello. How are you? Okay. Three words. Oh, and it works like as a title too. <laughs> Cecilia Munoz, we are so excited to have you after eight years um, in, in D.C. I can't wait to dig in a little bit about what you're doing, um, how the world feels to you right now in, in 2017, so we'll get there. And Max Berman, hello. How are you? Good. I love it. 
Do you see why I want these five people in that room or you know, solving the world's problems right here? Literally from the State House to the White House, from Middle America to the Middle East, these folks have really seen it all and done it all. One of the things that Susan Collins and I had talked about putting this panel together is talking a little bit about impact on equality. Um, but as a journalist, one of the things that I find really important is to define what it is we're actually talking about when we talk about specific issues, and I would love to get into a quick conversation. I don't, I don't need to, you know, again, do definitions and things like that, but, but I will go down the line and want to ask, what does inequality look like to you? When we're talking about inequality, what do you think we're talking about? Well, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, the playing field is level. Yeah. What does that really mean? Uh -huh. You know, I mean, these are concepts that are thrown out. And so when you talk about inequality, you can see it. I mean, if you can certainly go through the city of Detroit, where I'm from, and you know the areas that are thriving and the ones that are not. You know the business districts that need some help yeah. or maybe don't even exist. That's inequality. Neighborhoods should have certain resources. Mm -hmm. They should have business districts. They should have a bakery. They should have a place where you can buy real food. They should have a place where, you, you know, if you need your shoes repaired. I mean, just basic necessities mm -hmm. for living mm -hmm. to make a neighborhood vibrant and healthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, to say that, can you see it? Absolutely, you can. And that's just one aspect of... Right? You can measure it in terms of that, you know, different treatment to go back to some of the earlier panels today of um, kids in, in schools, the, the differential uh, application of school discipline policies. Like we learned from the data that we were suspending four-year-olds and they typically tended to be boys of color. Um, so you can, you can measure inequality through data. You can see it in, you know, the uh, treatment of different communities at the hands of police. You can see it in the way that we're responding to the, the storm in Puerto Rico as opposed to storms in other parts of the United States. Like there are things that you can measure, that you can see, that people can feel. Lejeune, I see you, you nodding a bunch. Yes, I would just add that it is uh, both structural and then there's a piece that's a mindset. Uh -huh. And I think when we talk about how you deal with it, you have to deal with both those issues. The structural is very measurable. Sometimes the mindset is not so measurable but it is very unconsciously present, and we should talk about that as well. Okay. But I'm the president of the United States decides to weigh in on a quarterback who decided he was going to protest police brutality in urban America. And not only does he not consider all of the issues that that brings about, but in his, to make them un-American, to, to make this a uh, discussion of whether or not they're patriotic, mm -hmm. and then to add SOB to the conversation, just, it's just one of the, you talk about a mindset. Exactly. I mean, it, it was a slap in the face, and in a way I was kind of glad I wasn't working, because I don't know what I might have said on the air that day, <laughs> you know? And, and I, mind you, I mean, report, Journalism is different today than it was when I started, and so you were asked to be objective. In, in fact, uh, you worked very hard mm -hmm. at it. Today, that's no longer the case. I mean, you can weigh in, you can give your opinion, but there are consequences to that. And too. I want to I get into that a little bit, Hardy. I want to hear from you, inequality, what, when we're going to have this conversation now, what are we talking about in your mind? Inequality of opportunity. Okay. The ability to, to choose one life mm -hmm. over rather than another type of life and, and notwithstanding the circumstance you're born into. Um, so, you know, having been born and having, excuse me, having been raised in Haiti, that for me is a very real issue that when I go back there, I think it's, you know, a, much of what I am fortunate to have probably has everything to do with where I was born. Um, and then there were some opportunities, particularly education, that allowed me to have one life over another. And so when I think of equality, inequality, I tend to think of it as, as access to opportunity. I, you know, my visit, I had a chance to visit Haiti right after the earthquake. And I was, I can't tell you, heartbroken that we would allow a country to exist in that condition 90 miles off the coast of Florida. 
and how, I mean, it certainly wasn't in great shape before the earthquake, but it was even in worse shape afterwards. And, but the fact that we didn't feel a sense of obligation to raise what standard of living, to make sure that the country was productive and moving in the right direction. And regardless of, of political views, certainly. But there's no reason for Haiti to continue to be the poorest country in, you know, on this side of the world. There's not in this day and age. I don't know, maybe. Because you don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. people, don't want, people don't want to see Puerto Rico either. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the president doesn't want to see it, but, but, but there are others who don't want to. And it's so easy to forget about it, you know, just let it go for a day, a month, uh, you know, a year, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't have to be a year. Uh, a, month, a month is more than enough time uh, for people to say, you know, well, I got to go on with my, my life here, and, and, uh, and so I will. And, and so that whether it's Haiti or, or Puerto Rico or whether it's various forms of inequality that are affecting, you know, men and women and, and people of color, I, it, you know, it, it's just... People may be grabbed for a moment, but then they go on to their lives. You know, I mean, and, and, and maybe they send a check, okay, <laughs> which is okay, which is a good thing. Uh, and and, uh, and I, because it's hard, to, it's, it's hard to keep caring every day. Okay? I mean, that's, that sounds terrible in a way, but, but it's, it's true, you know. had a conversation with two different women, uh, you know, very accomplished women, and they both started the conversation with, wow, I'm so sorry for that country. And I said, pardon me? <laughs> uh, Puerto Rico is uh, part territory. of the United States. Is the US where you, where, how do you understand it as a separate country? But that's what people have to do to reconcile why it is so different from anything the United States would ever call the United States. And in the case of Haiti, I would just say uh, for my foundation, it was a wake up call because we've been in existence for over 80 years and we would always say that our funding was in Latin America and the Caribbean. Hmm. And yet our work in Haiti was insignificant in the grand scheme. And we corrected that by committing ourselves to Haiti for the next generation. And that is now one of our priority places. And we work there, we have every day. But it's because of the horrific inequality that exists there. So you five were, were talking about inequality, we're talking about how other folks see inequality, but, but one of the things reading <laughs> about what each of, of you have done in your careers after graduating from the University of Michigan. Each of you seems to have this drive in you though, that when you see inequality, um, that you've been advocating for those on the margins to, to steal something that, that Hardy said. And I wonder what is that drive in each of you and, and where did you get it from? Where did that come? It's instilled in every student who walks on campus and walks into a classroom or a lecture hall. I mean, you're given this education so that you can go and do something with it, meaning make the world better. The way that you can do it in your own way. And I know I felt like that. I felt like I had been given a, you know, the letter of introduction to go ahead and, and you know, make my mark, to be the journalist that I had admired, you know, during my youth and certainly I don't know if I ever actually attained it, but I certainly gave it, you know, everything that I had to, to achieve that. And that spark just was re-energized by being here for the four years that I was here. And so I couldn't wait to leave. <coughs> I mean, I, you know, I couldn't wait to get out there and really see and, and apply. And I love that, that the, after 38 yeah, years of just that an knowledge. amazing career, she's still not sure that she made it. Let's let you know, you made it, you made it. <laughs> uh, Lejeune, where does, where does that drive come from for you? 30 years at, at uh, the Kellogg Foundation. What does that take to stay at a foundation and then see it grow and grow with it? You know, I've had, when I talk about passionate and committed, part of my journey has been um, that I believe I could have ended up on in, in either side of this inequality balance. Uh, and I've gotten to the side that I'm on because of my perseverance and my ability to be a fighter. Mm 
mm -hmm. and to also speak the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a story about the University of Michigan, and this is not to be derogatory. It's about how I learned to, to survive. Yep. Um, but when I arrived here, I, um, I really I knew that I wanted to be an accountant. Okay. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to go to the business school. And I had a plan, and I was on plan. And I met with um, someone who was very dear to my heart, Dr. Edwards, Albert Edwards, mm -hmm. who was a, a faculty member here at the University of Michigan. And he told me, these are the courses you have to take in your first two years in order to then apply to the business school and get accepted. Mm -hmm. And so I did exactly what he said. But what that meant was in one year, I had to take econ, statistics, and calculus. Mm -hmm. So I went to go to my registration counselor to take those courses. And uh, this woman told me I couldn't <coughs> register for those classes. And I said, why not? And she said, you'll never pass all those classes. Mm. You can't register for those classes. I'm not going to allow you to do that. And I said, oh, yes, I am, because if I don't, I won't get into the business school. And if I don't get into the business school, you know, my life is over. I have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I didn't know that the plan was even bigger than my own plan. But at the time, that was my goal. And uh, we fought. She said she wouldn't sign off on the registration. I registered anyway. I passed all the classes with a B or better. I was accepted into the business school. I became a CPA. And then that's when the plan changed, and now I'm the president of the Kellogg Foundation. <laughs> Not on plan, but it, so what that taught me was how low expectations, and that goes back to that issue of the mindset. You know, she didn't believe in me. And when I fight for children every day in public school systems and all the work that I do, I know that part of it is getting people to believe in those who have been disadvantaged and not make them victims, but make them champions of a system that hasn't served them well. And that's what drives me. And it's not that I have another positive story about the University of Michigan as well, because when I took my first accounting class, I was in a lecture hall like this. And because I had this plan, I have been studying accounting for a while. So I, had act I actually scored the highest in all the class on my first accounting exam. And my the graduate student came into a room like this and said, who is LeJune Montgomery? <laughs> and I was sitting there and I was like, me. <laughs> and he said, she scored the highest on this t exam. And you have to know that this was a white audience other than a few spots. Uh, and that was affirmation. Hmm. So on the one hand, there was someone that really just had low expectations. And it was someone else who decided to affirm my being. And that's what I fight for people to do with all people. Mm. Good for you. Mm. Hardy? I'll bring it back to Michigan as well. So prior to coming here, I think to the extent I had success in my life, it was somewhat sort of like luckily, right? It wasn't a, a plan, unlike Lejeune. Mine was just sort of like, you know, some of it was happenstance, some of it was just high school was easy, um, as the Catholic Brothers of Holy Cross High School probably um, moan, bemoan that point. But no, <laughs> um, So when I got to law school, I had a class, it was actually my last, uh, my last semester at law school, I had a Professor Robert Harris, who was then also the mayor of Ann Arbor. And I took his class, um, and the class um, was a, sort of a, a poverty class, and uh, I, my final paper I took this position about how the federal government should be in the business of funding abortion clinics. And um, so I wrote the paper and I thought it was like just, it, it, you know, it should have been sort of stapled to someone's church door, right? It was that good in my opinion. <laughs> um, we've all so, written those papers. I, you know, I was just like, Not this. everyone knows that they're that good, but we've all had those. I moments. dropped the mic over, right? I was like, there you go. So I got the paper back and he put A plus and he put two asterisks. And uh, it was like two sheets of paper, and then the asterisks were there, and he explained, and it was all comments, right? And it started off, he said, I gave you an A plus because you believed you deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it went downhill from there. <laughs> and it was essentially how, dear Hardy, you are a progressive Haitian American Democrat from a labor family in New York City, and you gave me just that. <laughs> And it just went on to say, you did nothing here that pushed yourself. You did nothing here that was extraordinary. You did what I thought you would do. And therefore, you really, really didn't get the point of this class. 
but here's your A+. Plus. And that infuriated me, <laughs> and yet it still sits with me yeah. to this day. And for me, it was, my, it was sort of, Professor Harris called me out, right? He was just like, you could do more, and you chose not to do it, and that's a pity. <laughs> I think I still ask myself, what would Professor Robert Harris do? Oh, I love and that. It's just, that's the gift that keeps giving. I love that. <laughs> Cecilia? So this university is my family's pathway to this country. My Your father went to U of M. Father. And my uncles. <laughs> all as foreign You were not going to go anywhere else, even if you wanted to. <laughs> but all as foreign students. Um, so the reason that... Um, I was born in Detroit is because my, my dad is a University of Michigan grad, as is my granddad. And my parents came from Bolivia a couple years before the law changed, which would have kept them out. Um, so I've, I grew up aware of that, um, that the, the whole, everything about my existence as a, as a Michigan girl uh, was completely different from my family that was still in Bolivia. And it was a little bit by accident. And I think that I know that drove me while I was here, and it's driven me ever since. How was it that your grandfather came to University of Michigan? <laughs> your old father. Um, my grandfather uh, had studied engineering, actually, in Switzerland, and came, went back to Bolivia, okay. and was visiting in the 1920s a friend in New York, and bumped, bumped into someone walking down Broadway, and said, you know, I think I'm gonna go for a graduate degree I'm not really sure where to go. And the friend said, oh, I know just the place. It's called Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> You're going to love it. And he and my grandmother were on the next train. And That's... that set the trajectory of my family, which you know, now affects all kinds of people. I, I um, spoke at a bicentennial event earlier this year where I told the story that we've, we've counted. There's been somebody, there's been a Munoz at the University of Michigan every decade for 100 years. Still someone today who's there? Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, Max, what about you? Where does that drive come from? Well, you know, that's where the drive comes from. I mean, I think it comes from a lot of parts of my life. Uh, certainly being at the University of Michigan, I think, uh, I, I think there's a certain... Um, uh, call for excellence that you hear while, while you're here. You, you hear them calling <laughs> about excellence. Um, uh, you know, I, I went on to, you know, I was to do what most graduates, um, college women college graduates did when, uh, you know, I was here, which was to become a teacher or a nurse. And those are essentially your options, right? Uh, that was 1968 I graduated. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, you, there, it wasn't just the University of Michigan, it was pretty much every single university in, the, in this country uh, that just didn't view women as having a value beyond being a teacher or a nurse. Um, and if you didn't like blood, like I didn't, then you were kind of, you know, you're pretty much scheduled into teaching. Um, and, uh, you know, that certainly changed over the course of years, but I, you know, I taught high school for years. I, I, I uh, uh, but there was always a little itch in me you know, to do something else. Uh, and I think by the time uh, I was in my sixth or seventh year of teaching, I was really getting that, you know, seven year itch to do something else. And, and I like politics. And, but I used to be pretty much on this, just kind of a watching it, you know, <laughs> an onlooker uh, seeing it. And, uh, and I, and I uh, at, at one point, uh, it was, I was telling you, it was 1975, I could tell you exactly. It was, I, I was looking for something else to do with my, my I needed something to do with my time. And, and uh, I, there was a presidential election the next year, so I, I did what uh, any good academic would do, because I was a good academic, uh, and, and there was no internet, uh, believe it or not. If you're under a certain age, there was no internet. <laughs> Five. And we, and we made it, yeah. Uh, we made it. Um, but but I, I went that. to the library. I went to the library to look up the candidates <laughs> who were running for president, and I read up on all of them. And believe it or not, in November of 1975, I decided, knowing not anything that I was talking about, that Jimmy Carter was going to be the next president of the United States. And everybody laughed at me and told me what a stupid fool I was. And look. Without the internet, I figured that out. <laughs> uh, 
but but I also but it but but the bug at that point was was completely planted. Um, but it was it was there was you know I think I think at that point though in my life too, um, and because I became very involved, I became far more aware. I mean, acutely aware of how much sexism there was. You know, when you're teaching high school, so are a lot of other women. And when you're teaching high school, at that time anyway, not, maybe not so much before me, you're getting the same salary. There, there, there used to be discrepancies in salary, but, the, but there were not when I was teaching. Uh, and uh, there were even a few women principals. So, so uh, but you know, when you wander into uh, other fields, like politics, uh, you know, the, the sexism is clear whether it's who's chairing a congressional district meeting or, or it's, it's quite clear. Uh, and uh, uh, I was uh, really, uh, uh, I don't want to say pushed, but <laughs> uh, pushed uh, hard by a lot of people to, to run for the legislature. Uh, they desperately wanted women. Uh, there just were so few women in the legislature. And, uh, and so I did, and you know, lo and behold, I won. Um, but I was one of, at that time then, 11 or 12 women out of 110 uh, members. And, and, you know, you want to talk about, you know, <laughs> being a tiny little minority uh, that nobody cares about, nobody remembers your name, and, then, you know, everybody calls you by everybody else's name because you all look alike, you know, uh, seriously. I mean, they call you, I mean, they, 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 they would call me by black women's names because I was a woman, right? And, and, uh, 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 so, and, and, but at that point too, I think, was also when I became really, you know, pretty adamant about getting more women in the legislature. You know, I chaired the Michigan Women's Campaign Fund and was very active in it for a number of years, which was a bipartisan organization to uh, get women, help women be elected, get the money to be elected to uh, the Michigan legislature or to uh, the judici uh, judiciary. Um, you know, and, and uh, we used to really, you know, we had mentoring, uh, I don't think they weren't formal mentoring programs, but we, you know, we helped new women legislators out. Uh, you know, my, my rule was, uh, if you are leaving, if, then you must find a woman to take your place. Or you can't go. Although, Max, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say, I mean, I will tell you that, that we've done a lot of interviews with state lawmakers um, on Michigan Radio, where, where I'm based, who I think I could close my eyes, and some of these stories would, would sound a little, a little familiar to me. I mean, maybe not about the names and things like that, but I think by last session in the state legislature in Michigan, it was 22% of, of lawmakers were women. That's, it's very, it's, well, term limits really uh, sure. killed women. Yeah. Uh, off, uh, um, you know, we had, uh, when I left, I think there was 30, there were th I think there were 31 women, 32, out again, out of 110, but that was a hell of a lot better than 11 or 12. Um, and, uh, but term limits, uh, you know, within five, six years, it was right back down to like maybe 20, 21 people again. And, uh, 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 you know, it, but it's, it's, uh, you know, if, if you know, Jennifer Granholm always used to say, if you can't see it, you cannot be it. So if you don't see women, all right, or if you don't see people of color doing things that you normally would not think they would be doing, uh, you know, e or even things that, uh, you know, that maybe you, 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 they, you should think they, sh they, they would be doing, but, but, but they're not. Well, and you were so frustrated, you, you wrote a book. I did. That you want to you tell folks the name yes, of that book? Yes, it was uh, The Only Boobs in the House Are Men. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Bailable. True title. Uh, and how did that book go over? Amazon.com. Uh, and through Our Media, I think, uh, carries it. Um, uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can. I've ordered uh, it recently. You have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Ships in three days. You can get it. But... Um, yeah, well, that was started out as just uh, a, a kind of a, you know, weekly uh, pouring out my frustrations, and then ultimately got to be a little bit more, you know, formal and formalized. I still keep in touch now and then with Bill Haney, who was the publisher then of Momentum Books, that, that was actually the publisher of it at the time. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it was very difficult. Um, uh, there was nothing in the book that wasn't true. 
Um, I did not use names. I didn't want to hurt anybody. I wasn't out to hurt anybody. Uh, well, there was a couple people. I could, well, <laughs> there, was, there was a couple people who were who were dead. All right, so I figured it was okay, uh, or that everybody already knew, uh, you know, the stories, so it was okay. Uh, but um, and that was men and women both. All right, I mean, uh, but but uh, I mean, you have to. Well, this this past week which was an amazing week in, in politics for so many different reasons. Uh, but there's a, an organization called Emerge, which is a national organization, but there's also an Emerge Michigan and Emerge in many other states, which was organized and put together in order to help women um, get elected to office. But any office, it doesn't have to be the United States Senate. You know, it could be the, 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 the sidewalk supervisor in Redford Township, okay? Just get yourself in that pipeline. Just get in there, and they help, and they teach people how to do this, and they help them raise money. And uh, in Tuesday's elections, uh, 85 eMERGE graduates were elected to something across the country, 85. So that's what you need to do. You have to put that hand out, and you have to keep it out, uh, and, and uh, uh, and also, I mean, getting mad doesn't hurt. Uh, I mean, getting mad is a good thing. Uh, of the, of the uh, I don't want to get too political here, but, but who cares. Um, I, of the uh, six, there were 16 uh, um, men in uh, Virginia who lost their house seats, their state house seats. Uh, and uh, 11 of those people who beat them were women. Yeah. And, and so, you know, when you, when you see that anger, something, from my perspective, something good's going to happen, all right? Me, <laughs> I mean, me, from, uh, some people, when something bad's going to happen. From my, from my perspective, something good's going to happen. And let me pick up, though, on that word, the anger and the frustration, because I think so many times when you do see inequality, one of the easiest things to do is just get angry about it and seethe about it and let that build into resentment against systems. Maybe that's even a little bit of what we saw in 2016, one could argue. Now, whether it was fair, the people that felt you know, was, was unequal or not can, can be a different conversation for another time. But how do you move from anger and frustration into action? For folks who are so angry, but each of you now doing amazing things, have done amazing things, how did you turn anger and frustration into something powerful, which, which looks like results? Cecilia? So it's funny, I wrote about this actually. I mean, anger is kind of, um, has been, I think, an animating force for me and becoming a civil rights advocate actually. You wrote about it in a This I Believe essay for NPR, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was about, it was called Getting Angry Can Be a Good Thing. Um, and it stems from someone that I really cared about in high school. When I was, so I was in high school in the late 70s and there were conflicts in Central America going on that my family would talk about at the dinner table being Latin Americans. And this dear friend who knew my family well said, you know, if we were to ever get in a war with them, your family should probably end up in an internment camp. And it was, that was my moment of recognizing, oh, wow, wait, I'm, I'm an other. I hadn't quite grasped it until then. A family, I mean, people you were close with, right? Yeah. Um, and that was when I understood at any point anybody could be an other. And at any point, we are capable of these things, of these terrible things, which I thought of as historical things, which didn't happen anymore, and which, of course, still do. And we're getting a lesson in that nearly every day. But I'm also, I think I'm wired to be a pragmatist. In the, in the eight years that I was in government, I feel like I learned a lot about the difference between being righteous, which is important, um, and being strategic, which is more important, right? That it is not enough. I mean, I sat across the table from a lot of advocates, and I was an advocate for more than 20 years. I sat across the table from a lot of my old friends um, who, the, who, in some cases, were really helpful in giving me the tools within government to move things forward. And in other cases, they were not very helpful because it was more important for them to be right and be righteous and to kind of speak their truth, which I respect, 
but they also weren't giving me any tools to help us get anywhere. I, I ran into that. I ran into that in the right? legislature too, of, of groups who wanted help for me, and I wanted to help them. Except they didn't really want the help. I mean, they just wanted to come in and scream, yeah. and rant. And I kept saying, "Well, well let's," or you know, or I want, you know, I want ten thousand dollars for, for something. You know, well, ten thousand. I can open a drawer in, in Lansing and find ten thousand dollars. It's not a problem. But you know, you can't always get ten thousand. I said, "Well, let's do five, and you know, maybe not. no." It's got to be 10. I can't get 10. You see those faces up there on that committee? They ain't giving you 10. I can get you five. You know, and they wouldn't take it. And, and, you know, you and, they, and they wouldn't take it. Yep. You know? I mean, and, and I was so angry. And I said, you know, go find another advocate. I'm not helping. That's it. That, that, I'm, I'm just not helping you. You know? I mean, and I knew they'd find somebody else. And they did. But, but it, you know, you, you, yeah. I mean, people who would rather be angry and rant then actually produce and something progress. and yeah and make progress. Carmen, you're you were nodding heartily <laughs> to that. Well, you know, I was thinking, how did I process anger? I mean, certainly in and, uh, trying to navigate my way from radio to television, I ran into people that said, "Well, you need more experience. You need to do this." Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember going out as a cub reporter, a young reporter, with a camera crew for the very first time, and you could, I could feel that there was an, an issue with my gender. I'm not sure if it wasn't a combination of both. And the cameraman said, I wanted to go out with a real reporter. <gasps> so, I mean, after I pulled myself together, I, I didn't hit him. <laughs> <laughs> but I got angry. Yeah. I really did. I mean, we did the story, and he became eventually one of my biggest fans. But just that initial reaction to, well, I wanted to go out, which meant a guy. I wanted to go out with a male reporter because, you know, they could talk male things. And here I was, this yeah. young female, uh, sitting in the back of the car. <laughs> but, you know, and, and so you confront it individually, certainly, as you said, you know, uh, politically as well. But I didn't get stuck. I mean, I had to choose, like, how I was going to process it. And so I, I did get angry, but I couldn't stay there. Because if I had stayed there, then I wouldn't have been able to move forward. And that is something that, you know, every individual has to decide for themselves how they're going to do that. But yeah, anger is good. Anger can be motivating. Don't stay there. Don't let it become your existence. It cannot. It's harmful. It's ineffective and it will blind you from the things that you can really do and the opportunities that you can really have. You won't see them if you stay angry. Yes. And I had to realize, I mean, this is, I said, you know, I'm just getting started. This guy's been around the block or whatever, and they're getting ready to take film out of the newsroom, put it, videotape was going to be the new way of doing things, so he was adjusting, you know, and I watched it when general managers became, you know, when women became general managers, and you could see the reaction among some of the men in the building that they were, had never worked for a woman before, and what was that gonna be like? So the, the fear was the other part, and that was what I wasn't going to allow. He became a big fan of yours, so he said, he would you, would you remind him of, of <laughs> that he would say that to you? I'm sure I did. I, I, I'm sure I did. But he never forgot it, and neither did I. Let me, but let as me I ask said, you, let me ask, uh, or at least the women on, the, on this panel, how many of you in the last uh, month, I guess this was when it started, maybe a month ago, said, uh, yeah, me too? Oh, yeah. My goodness. Absolutely. I mean, it... Do any of us know someone who, who, wouldn't, who didn't have the ability to say it, like for whom it wasn't true? I, I, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm so proud of younger women for being willing to say me too, you know, because I was afraid to, right? Uh, uh, I mean, I was afraid to. That would, that would, I don't, I could put it any other way. And I was working in the uh, corporate world at the time, by the way, uh, for a brief stretch. Um, that's why, I, see, I learned something. I don't work there. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that Me Too, for a whole lot of women, I mean, uh, thousands, millions in this country said Me Too. 
So. Lejeune, working working through anger, making sure it doesn't keep you down. I can think about you know you trying to register for those three classes and and being able to just sit in that anger, but you move forward. Um, I think I'm actually energized by anger. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, two things. I think it taught me how to dialogue and how to negotiate, and uh, it provides me a level of energy to just overcome mm -hmm. that is really, really uh, palpable. So whenever I'm angry, that means something is not happening. <laughs> 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 and uh -oh. it's not in a violent space, but it is, we are going to deal with this. And, and it's very strategic, um, but it's very purposeful. Um, and it's just been constantly the way uh, I've operated. I think in my work now, um, I, you know, when I encounter the work we do for children and how much of it is systemic because of a structural racist society, yeah. uh, our anger has been to, one, tell the truth about it. We have an an initiative called the True Racial Healing and Transformation Effort. We are funding this work all over the country. And it's based from a deep-seated anger, but an understanding that in order to address these structures, you first have to address it with the truth. And, and part of that is going back and, and understanding the history and the narrative that was creative versus the factual narrative, mm -hmm. and giving people a, a place and a space to rediscover the true history from there to actually heal, because our history has been one that has polarized us as people, and to provide space for people to build solid relationships, and that's the dialogue piece. If you turn that anger into communication and dialogue, you can learn a lot. There's a level of understanding. And then you take that space of understanding and now a shared history and you change things together. So that's a strategic platform that we've built for uh, cities all over the United States in Dallas and Los Angeles and Chicago and Battle Creek, Michigan. And, and, and you know, what we're finding is it's making a difference. You know, oh, no, no, please, go, go. I was going to say, as, re as reporters, especially when you're covering a city like Detroit that certainly has a very strong political base, mostly Democrat, but there are Republicans there too. You don't see many of them, but they're there. And to he hear the activists, and they were the, the same faces, the same names that would show up at every rally. Uh -huh. I mean, and it almost started to take on a professional look. It looked like a profession because they were always there. And I remember being asked by um, Mayor Kilpatrick at the time to host a town hall meeting. Mm -hmm. And of course in the front row because his rhetoric thrived on that kind of banter, that kind of controversy. I mean, he Certainly had to did. have it. And asking me to, to moderate his town hall was probably not a good idea. <laughs> because I diffused it immediately. I mean, once I saw them, because I knew what they were coming there for. But he wanted that. And, you know, in the front row, they were, you know, they were sprinkled around. And you could feel the momentum trying to get started. And I would turn it around. Hmm. And at the end of the town hall meeting, which I thought was still productive, maybe not in the way that he was hoping, that it would be, it still worked. And he never asked me to moderate another time. <laughs> but you know, when you want to hear ideas exchanged, the last thing you need are people who are willing to disrupt and be sure. disruptive. I mean, sure. It just gets old after a while. But it makes for good TV, I, I suppose. But. Hardy, I, I, I want to turn to you, and, and certainly um, last but not least, and I, I really want to direct this question at you because um, you've seen equality, and, and you've seen it in really tough circumstances. You've, you've worked with um, Syrian refugees, legal rights. You've been to Guantanamo Bay. I mean, we're talking about serious inequality that I could see could not just make you angry, but just sort of... Um, uh, depressed about the world around you. How do you fight 
through that on a daily basis when you probably see things that very few of us in this room have ever seen? I work with asylum seekers. I work with refugees who uh, have stories, uh, have, have life journeys that are remarkable. And these women and men have endured things. I mean, we, we have a client um, who was sexually assaulted by her grandfather, her father, and her husband over the course of several decades. And when you meet with her, this is a person you say, if, you, if there's so anyone has a right to be angry, that person, right? Right, right. And she speaks in tones of, she uses words like, I forgive them. <sighs> and I think, I, I'm not sure I could have the capacity to pull that word out. And she, and she means it, and, and she's not an outlier. Right, that so many of our clients have been through so much and they have the right to be angry and somehow they channel something else. And I, I think that for me is inspiring, right? That I go, how dare I be angry when he, she, they're not there. And so I think that sort of checks me regularly. And I also, I'm reminded of sort of what Cecilia said, that anger is a useful starting point. When I've allowed it to take me through I rarely have looked back and said that was, a, that was a, it, it, an exercise that had some productivity to it. Right? So being angry at first is helpful to me, but when I carry it through, I usually end up in a dark place. And I remember in, in law school, we had an incident where someone wrote outside of a clinical law professor's door, door just says, like, go home, N-word. And um, so we, the students of color at that time, I think we had a lot of pent up anger, a lot of sexism and racism at the school at the time. This was in the late, uh, mid, mid 90s. And so we formed this civil, civil disobedience movement. And one of the things that we did, and I was one of the people who pushed this, was we had this, um, this vote where we, we, we cast this issue of, to the faculty of, are you with us or are you against us? And we worded this in a way that said, either you support students of color and women at this law school or you don't. And then we took a piece of parchment paper, put it up in the first floor of Hutchins Hall, listed the professor's name and said, yay or nay. And then we said, and if you abstain, you're a no, you're not with us. And one of my professors pulled me aside in the hallway and said, you know, I'm with you, but I'm not with every single point of that, the, the way you've casted the ballot, but I'm with you. And I said, well, you gotta, you gotta make a decision, right? Yay or nay. Um, and I lost him as a supporter. I, in, in more ways than one, I lost him as a supporter. And I realized that what was driving me through the whole time was anger. And, and ultimately, I lost an ally, and, and I'm not sure what we really accomplished because of the way I, I was driving it. And so I, I look back at that and go, this is a useful starting point, but at some point I gotta check myself. And like I said, being surrounded by women and men who have done and gone through things that I can only begin to fathom is a useful device to, 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 to cause me to pause. Carmen, one of the things you were talking about, uh, again, as a journalist, is this idea of figuring out how you can be impactful um, without advocating, right? And, and you said this past year, maybe it's a good thing that you haven't been live <laughs> on air. Um, but what is that like, and what was that, that line like about how far you could go about telling a story before it became advocacy, or before you said, you know what, enough is enough? You know, I never watched my shows. Mm -hmm. Only because I treated it as a live performance and most live performers don't go back and watch their shows. But I'm sure if I had, I would have recognized something that's been very constant throughout my career, probably throughout my life. I'm an open book. You know where, uh, what I think about something, I don't have to say it. I can look at you and you can see my reaction and you know, you know whether it's upsetting, whether I'm hurting, if I'm joyful. So I didn't have to make a stance. I mean, you know, the commentary that I did asking the mayor of Detroit to resign was, I mean, did I really feel that he needed to? Absolutely. I had done my work. I talked to people about it because I couldn't understand why in the world were we going through this when he needed to step aside, right? And why wasn't he getting that message? Who was it around him that told him, oh, don't worry about that. You don't have to do that. You're the mayor. Well, that's not king, you know? And 
You know, that's actually a commentary I, I, I did watch, and you could see my, the feelings about it. And did he resign as a result of it, of that commentary? Probably not, but the pressure was on. And all I did was put it out there. And when people heard it, they were like, thank goodness somebody said it, because whoever he was depending on, they were telling him just the opposite, and that's what he was choosing to believe. And then he shortly did resign after that. So I, you know, I, am I proud of that? Probably not, because no reporter, no journalist should have to be in a position to call a political leader out like that when they should know better, when they're intelligent and they're surrounded by people who are advising them. They should know better. But, I mean, the newsroom was energized beyond belief when the, uh, <laughs> When those text messages came into the newsroom and we, I mean, they couldn't, const they couldn't think about anything else. I mean, they were reading, you know, very descriptive. These were messages between the former mayor, the former and, mayor his and his staff. chief of staff. Mm -hmm. And then there, there were other women involved. I mean, it just, it, so there was just this energy in the newsroom that we couldn't get anything accomplished. It's like if he doesn't step aside, the city was in a standstill. There was a, a, a presidential election on the horizon. The candidate for the Democratic Party couldn't come into the city of Detroit because he couldn't take pictures with the you Barack know, Obama. What, you yeah. Know, I mean, yeah. So I mean, we were hurting on all levels, and being indecisive at that time, I felt was more harmful than it was. And all I did was ask him to make a good decision at that point. So how how do you speak truth to power then when you see inequality? And Cecilia, maybe I'm looking at you because I did just say President Barack Obama. Were there moments where you had to say, Mr. President, this is not okay. This is not right about issues that you felt passionate about? Not right. Um, um, so it's not like I had to <laughs> in his face to tell him something that he knew. But part of what he expected his team to do was give him bad news and, and, or tell him when we thought that there was a direction, uh, an issue going in the wrong direction. And it was very clear that he, he, he expected that from his team, that your job includes especially being able to be in his face and deliver, and deliver bad news. If you're not doing that, then you're not being effective. For me, I was very frequently the only Hispanic person in the room. At, at the senior table, I was, um, for, I was the only Hispanic woman for sure. And for a while, I had a, uh, there was a Latino male who ran the Ledge Affairs Department, but otherwise, it, I was it. And granted, this was a room full of amazing people who, you know, all worked for the same president and all shared the same values, but it's still, I didn't know everything that they knew, but they also didn't know everything that I knew. And the struggles that stick with me the most are the times, and I, I'm, I'm seeing Lejeune nodding her head, because I know you've been there too, when there is a truth that you understand that it's important for other people to understand um, and, you, and you're not always finding the words or finding a way to, um, for people to hear it in a way that they will absorb. I never had that problem with the president. He's a very empathetic and amazing human being. But I did sometimes with my colleagues. And um, uh, it, the thing that I drew strength from was that I was very sure that that was why he had asked me to serve in the first place, like that he understood who I was and what I was bringing to the table and the clear message I had from him was, I know they don't always understand and that's why I need you there, so keep at it. And, but for me, the most painful moments were when I would say the words and I could tell people didn't get it. And I really, I would practice, I really would, I'd practice on my walks and in my car and I would try out some of my arguments on Valerie Jarrett, who is another person who regularly sort of understood and created kind of a safe space to, to go in where you could go in and say, I've, I just failed in this meeting. How do I, help me succeed. Um, but it's, it's important to have faith in the notion that the thing that you know, the thing that you bring to the table is enough, um, and your job is to articulate it in a way that will get through to people. And that's hard when you don't have you know, a principal uh, or someone that you're looking up to that gives you that respect or gives you the room to do that. I can't imagine doing it for somebody that wasn't gonna have my back. 
right? The whole reason I went into government, I did it reluctantly. I hadn't, it wasn't part of my plan. But the reason that I did it, I, I knew that it would be among the most challenging experiences of my life, which was true. I also knew that a lot of my friends would be angry with me because I would have to make decisions that they weren't happy about. I knew that going in. But it was okay because I knew I was working for somebody who, it's not just that he would have my back, but working for somebody whose judgment I respected. And I felt he isn't gonna ask me to, um, to explain a decision in my own community that I don't feel good about. Uh, and that's what made it possible. I, I, you know, I, I have been very fortunate in, in choosing great bosses. Um, and that's, when I give career advice to people who are younger than me, that is a regular feature of what I say. Like, pick your bosses well, um, because you'll learn from them, but also when it's time to stand up for something difficult, you'll, it will give you more capacity to do that. And that's part of a job description that is never really clear. I mean, it's something that's inherited after you've been around the block long enough and you've been there and you've got that kind of respect and I'm going to say integrity and so um, and it's an honor it really is an honor and so when you know in the newsroom it, I just enjoyed being in the newsroom and talking to the you know whether they were interns reporters or whatever and they were, my door was always open and they could always come in if they were curious about how a story you know, played and what my thoughts were about something. But uh, you know, when retirement is good too, though. I, <laughs> yeah, it is. I will tell, I will tell you that, <laughs> as much as I enjoyed it. I want to make sure that we, we get to some audience questions, because I don't, I don't want to just keep all of these folks to myself, although I could continue, continue to do this. But I think one of the, the questions that I have still is, are things getting better when we talk about inequality? Are folks learning more about how to make an impact when it comes to inequality? I hope so. I know that. Um you know, you will hear about the tale of the two Detroits. You, I mean, it's something that's been talked about for years, probably existed long before. Um, they called it the tale of two Detroits. And now that we've got, uh, we just reelected the current mayor back. I mean, and I believe that he is determined to make sure that that dividing line starts you know, to blur by making sure that the, the neighborhoods who may feel as if they're not being considered or not included in the progress that the city is making, that somehow, you know, they're made to understand that, no, no, our progress won't succeed unless we include those neighborhoods as well. And how do you do that? Well, that's why they, you know, that's why we have elected officials and, and certainly, but we know what happens when you leave communities out of that mission. I mean, certainly, you know, looking back at the riots 50 years later, you ask yourself, well, why did Detroit er erupt that way? And it was because people didn't feel as if they were included. They Although, got to feel that way. And I will say, interestingly enough, though, it, it's been 50 years and we've done some reporting that actually, though, a lot of the systematic issues that were happening in the city 50 years ago that, that led to the rebellion or the riots, however you want to talk, it, or talk about it, are, are actually in place, maybe have shifted a little bit, but a lot of those similar theories have not changed. The only thing I would say, though, is the dialogue is different now. Mm. The dialogue has, while it's been more explicit, mm -hmm. there's, it's also called many people to the table to say, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't what we want mm -hmm. moving forward. And I've found more partners mm -hmm. in the last year. I think about Mayor Duggan's speech on Mackinac, where he just laid out, this is what we did to this city. Mm -hmm. These were the bad policies that created segregation. Segregation leads to racism. He laid it out. Uh, 
the same conversation is happening now in Mississippi. I was mm -hmm. speaking with the governor of Mississippi recently, a Republican governor, and he finally said, you know, we're not doing that by mm -hmm. our children. Mm -hmm. So there is a moment now, and mm -hmm. I do think we have to take advantage of this moment uh, and leverage it, but it's been so out there, mm -hmm. and we hope that it never goes back no one underneath wants it now, and that's no, what I don't care whether talking about yes, it. exactly. Yeah. People are now saying, you know what? I may have been complicit. I'm no longer going to be complicit mm -hmm. because this is just crazy. Yeah. For those of, of you, um, what Lejeune is talking about is there's something called the Mackinac um, Policy Conference. Some of you folks might know about it, and, and Mayor Mike Duggan, a Democrat, spoke to a room that I think it's probably fair to say is at least 50-50 Republicans, Democrats at this conference, if not a little more conservative than that, business folks. And he had that room quiet on the edge of their seats. And he did it, mind you, too, on, on scribbled out notes. Yes. It, it, you can still find it actually on YouTube, I think, at the conference's schedule. I was in the room and folks were just silent listening. And this is a group of people that doesn't like to listen to other people talk. They like to hear themselves talk. Um, watch this video if you want afterwards, because it's, it's uh, A, just incredibly moving. Um, they gave him a standing They order. certainly did. So they certainly did. The yeah, yeah. Uh, back to my point. Yeah. And right now, the truth is about yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hardy, are things moving in a in a better direction? <laughs> Working with refugees, it's a uh, it's been a difficult year. I mean, to say the very least. Um, starting on January 27th with the travel ban, uh, and I, we have most of our clients are living in fear of uh, stepped up deportation efforts. Um, I mean, it seems like every day you read something where the other is being targeted once more. So it, it is, if I'm not careful, I probably wouldn't get out of bed in the morning because I'd say, what's the point? Uh, but in the midst of all this, I also saw at Human Rights First, we were getting phone calls from all over this country of people saying, we've got your back, what do you need from me? I mean, I, I mean the weekend of the travel ban, uh, as many of you know, I mean, lawyers from all over the country were at airports. And so a group of us were at Dulles Airport late into the night, and we had to go back to the office to get press releases done. And a local synagogue called and said, we're going to feed you tomorrow. What do you want to eat? And I was like, who are you? <laughs> you know? And they brought lunch for us. And it was something small, but for me, it was affirming. Right? It was like, all is not lost. Right? That, that it's easy for me to think that this is a moment of darkness and light will never come again. And then I looked at all of these wonderful people from the synagogue feeding us, and that was just one instance. And I thought, you know, it, this is still our, my America, right? I mean, there are things about it I'm not liking right now, but, but actually there's always been things I don't like about it, but all is not lost. And I, I have to think that way, because if I don't, what's the point, right? I'm, I'm going to phone it in. I'm just not going to get out of bed in the morning. I'm going to say, I, I can't give up, right? So I have to believe the narrative of this too shall pass. Um, and... Uh, it, but like I said, it's, it, it's, it's allowed some really good forces of justice to step forward and shine a light on those women and men in those movements. I mean, you know, I was at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in Richmond, Virginia in May for a travel ban oral argument, and I watched a sort of a spontaneous protest break out, and I was like, and that's my America. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, these forces that you're pushing against, it's not, I mean, this isn't new. Right. Right. We're, we are capable of extraordinary things for good and for bad. That's always been true. I, I found myself saying to my colleagues at the White House, you can imagine how we were all feeling after this, the you know, election of a year ago. Uh, look, it's the same country that elected Barack Obama twice. Like, we didn't stop being that place, but we were also the same place that enslaved people and interned people and did a lot of terrible stuff. Like, we are all of those things. All, that's, all of that is who we are. It's what we do with it that's important. And in the, uh, our behavior, our response, our pushback in moments like this one is, is the most important thing. It's what determines where we will get when we get to the next place. But the, uh, as you know, the, the president liked to say to us, especially in the last couple of months we were there, like the arc of history still bends towards justice, but it's not a straight line. Like what made you think it would be a straight line? It's never been a straight line, but it's it's the hands on that arc bending that matter, and that's that's up to us. Well, I don't, I don't know, and maybe I'm watching too much MSNBC, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
You're not the only one, Max. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I wake up and it's still on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, a part of me says when you, when you ask that kind of a question, you know, of course we're not better, you know? I mean, and then there are those good things. Uh, and, and, and I know that the arc of justice keeps bending the right way. Um, it's just so damned hard sometimes. Uh, and it's so damned hard to keep fighting sometimes. You know, it, it's... it's uh, uh, and, and then, of course, I realize that they just want to wear me out, and that just kicks me, <laughs> gets me going all over again, you know. But that is, that is part of the, you know, uh, that, that, that is part of their philosophy, is just wear them down. You know, and, and uh, I think one of the great things from this year, uh, uh, again, going back to women, uh, the anger of women and the, and the waking up of women, starting with the day after the inauguration. I mean, and, and, that, and that enormous and uh, I, amazing, all over this, all over the world, for heaven's sakes, of women out protesting all over the world. I mean, who thought, who would have thought it, you know? I mean, they, they got to Lansing, I thought that'd be far enough, you know? <laughs> and, and uh, but all over the world, and then, and, 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 and that they keep going, and that they ran this time, and they were there, you know? And I just have a suspicion that for a while, anyway, they're gonna be there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's uh, but it is hard, because, you know, you, you know that, uh, you know, good things are happening, and and and, uh, uh, but you know, and on, on the other hand, you also know that you got three more years that you got to wait, uh, <laughs> and hope that you end up with you know that I don't have to keep watching MSNBC, <laughs> um, uh, and and that's and that's difficult. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, we are a. Uh, I mean, I I love my country. I just know that there's a lot of warts. You know, and and uh, uh, it it would be it would be ever so nice. And 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 the problem is, is that sometimes we see warts differently. You know, uh, I don't. I mean, I don't. Uh, I, I find that people who are you know burning the flag to be pretty obnoxious. But I think that you have a right to burn the flag. I think the flag is there because it gives you a right to burn it. Uh, and uh, don't throw anything at me. Uh, but but um, uh, you you have to you know you have to see those those dualities and understand that it's okay to it's okay to understand the dualities and that in fact it's better to understand the dualities than not um, because uh, uh, it's it's been a very very difficult year for people who care about government, uh, and I do mean now, I'm talking now about the very structure of government. I mean, I care deeply about the physical structure of government, the three branches of government. I, I care deeply about those things. I care deeply about, you know, the, the department of this, the department. I care deeply about those things. They, there's a reason for them, and they do good jobs. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and when I see them and when I see people undoing those, those departments, when I see them undoing a, stru a, a structure of government, a piece of government, when I see people you know, dumping on judges because they don't like the way the judge ruled, well, that's how it's supposed to be. You know? Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And that's the same with political you know, elections, too. But it's, it's, uh, it, it has been for, you know, for many of us here, <laughs> A difficult year, and you know, you hope that things just get better. That's all, you know. I mean, I don't know if you had friends that called you or family members that called you and said, "What are we going to do?" <laughs> I, I don't know if I want to live here anymore. I mean, you heard the extreme reaction. How are we going to get through this? We're strong. We're Americans. This is America. This is the land for all of us, not just some of us. And we have to make sure that we continue to make that work so that it's for everyone, not just a select few. And deplorable behavior is there. Doesn't mean that every deplorable person is un-American. My children called me the next day and 
and I listened to them, and you know what I told them? Raise good children. Mm. If you want to give back in that way, with the grandchildren, raise good, honest, law-abiding, hard-working Americans. And then you were like, bring them to me so I can see my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I want to open it up to questions. Um, so Susan, how, how about we do this, that just um, raise your hand and someone will come to you with a microphone so we will make it even easier. Um, and why don't you go ahead and say who you are before you ask a question to one of these fine folks. And it is hard for me to believe that there are no questions for the five who are, who are on my right here. Yeah, yeah, right here. Do you, oh, to the mic. Oh, oh, you want them to go to the mic? Okay, sure. A dozen or so years. Um, my question is, how do you feel the impact of technology and its growth over the past 20 years? Um, and its resulting displacement of workers and flattening of wages um, has impacted the political tone and tenor that we have today. Actually, a thing that I work on, but let me start by saying, you said you're an Air Force vet. Thank you for your service. Um, ah. <laughs> so um, technology by itself isn't, isn't good or bad. It's, it's, it's how it gets used. Um, that, right? And so there's lots and lots of negative potential, but there's also lots and lots of positive potential. But um, we are in a time that's like the Industrial Revolution in terms of the scale of change and the, um, the pace of it. It's a lot of change really fast that's going to have a transformative impact. And we learned some stuff last time that hopefully are lessons that we can apply this time, which is kind of what I'm it's what I'm doing at the organization where I'm working now, which is called New America. Um, the, the, it took us last time several decades before we passed things like child labor laws and developed labor unions and put the structures in place that, that mitigated some of the harms of the kind of rapid technological change. So like, we shouldn't wait for, we, we can anticipate some of what's going to happen here and we can get ahead of it. Um, Technology has the capacity to give us the tools to actually reduce inequality, um, or it could increase inequality. But if it's going to reduce inequality, that's not going to happen by itself, right? We have to be deliberate about it. And we know, look, you can anticipate what some of the negative effects are going to be. We have some information about the kinds of jobs which are likely to shift. And we know which communities typically get left behind because that has been true for a really long time. So instead of having a conversation about, holy mackerel, the robots are coming for our jobs and we're all gonna get screwed again and there's nothing we can do about it. We're trying to have a conversation that says, all right, there's technological change. How do we make sure that we put the tools in the hands of, of people so that they can be driving this change in a way which catapults their communities forward? That that's the question that we're trying to ask. And we're trying to, my, uh, in particular, I'm engaged in an effort to put technological tools and technologists themselves, the people who develop them, um, on the staffs of nonprofits and in, uh, you know, on the staffs of people like Mayor Duggan. And, and we should be using technology to solve our problems and not just assume that technology is the problem. But that takes deliberate work and investment and forethought. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Gabrielle Horton. I'm a second year uh, Master of Public Policy candidate at the Ford School um, in Hardy. Uh, it's good to see you again and thank you all for all of your comments. But Hardy in particular, you had a comment that really struck me um, talking about or reflecting on your time at the law school and thinking about how you sort of distant yourself from a professor who could have been a really great ally. And I think that that's a word that we keep hearing over and over again, thinking about intersectionality and allyhood and who's an ally. And I guess I would be curious to hear from you and perhaps one other person on the panel about some of the best tips or suggestions you think about in terms of cultivating allies. Where does sort of like that boundary get drawn between, I guess, you sort of educating and doing all of this like emotional labor, but then also finding ways and spaces to actually support others along that journey and perhaps towards a, a much larger goal as well? So if you have any tips or suggestions for folks who are doing this work and thinking about how to incorporate and best work with allies, I'd be curious to hear about that. 
Thanks. And allies anywhere, right? So I, I try not to sort of presuppose that my allies are only going to be found in this forum or in this area. I, I think I, I do myself a disservice if I, if I think of it that way. I, I, I think in terms of forming relationships, because that's what it's really it's about, it's about relationship building, that I, I do my best relationship building if I can um, talk like I know what I'm talking about and listen like I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> right? So that I think to the, to the sense that I can, to the extent that I can ensure that I, I, I'm open to learning, that's an important piece of this ally building, right? Because when I come to the table saying that I've got all the answers and surely you don't, so please, you know, lean forth and take notes, I've got myself, a, a, I've got a problem. I, um, and also, and I, and I recognize also with the ally building, since we do a lot of that human rights first, that sometimes we're going to be allies on X, Y, but maybe not Z. That's okay, right? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that we can't come back and, and, and regroup on something else. And so I, I'm pretty forthright about that. I go, I'm gonna work with you on this. This, we're, we're not gonna be able to be on the same sheet of music, so I wish you well. I'll catch up with you next time. And I think having sort of candid discussions and assessments of that are helpful. And to use Cecilia's words, be strategic, right? That I, I do, especially in, in our line of work, that um, we've gotta think thoughtfully about who our allies are and, uh, and make a plan uh, to go about it and recognize that when it comes to being allies, it all pivots on sincerity, right? That, that if, if I can't truly be your supporter on this, I should own that and be forthright about it. And if I am going to be your supporter on that, then that means I'm gonna represent myself in a certain way. That means I'm gonna speak up for you in a certain way. Um, there's a certain commitment involved in that. So those are the things I would, I would say. Lejeune or anyone else wanna? I was just gonna quickly say that it feels so relevant about this idea about figuring out what we can agree on, whereas it feels like, and maybe this is technology or you know, social media has figured out how to talk so much about what we disagree on, or this idea that if, you know, if we're not 100% on board for the same policy or the same way of thinking about something, that's it. Instead of accepting, you know what, we've got some differences, but overall, probably, we've got more similarities about what we want, you know, health, goodness for our families, to be able to take care of our loved ones. Lejeune, please. Yeah. yeah. Taking people from kind of dichotomous thinking, this or that, in or out. And that's why I was laughing earlier when you put the chart up and said, you're either in or out. And I could see me doing that at one point. And uh, now I've learned that, you know, uh, a lot of that type of thinking is what's ingrained in us. Part of that is the, you know, something that's much more deeper about how you build division in a country as opposed to alignment. Um, so when I think about allies, I think some of the best work I've done is in this space around and working with an organization called White Men as Diversity Allies. And basically it's a, it's a space where we talk about how you can have allies um, even some that you may not think would be your ally, but how they can be an, an ally and how you can receive that. And I think part of that journey is getting to that space. And some of my best allies, I, I would not be sitting in the seat had it not been at, for certain people who chose me. I didn't choose them, uh, but I had to receive that. And it had to take me to a new space of trust and openness. And so there's a lot of growth in that relationship, and I think you have to show up re ready to grow and ready to learn something different than you knew when you started out. Uh, but it could, I think that's the journey we all have to take. Cecilia, I'd love your thoughts too on it though, just going back to the idea of, of working um, not between two separate groups, but I, you know, I think one of the things that you dealt with at the White House was the idea of, of dealing with immigrants and then dealing with a, a president who some folks didn't always think was very kind to immigrants or calling him the deporter in chief and you having to go back and forth between the White House and, and some allies. What was that like and how did you deal with that role of being so in the middle? So the person who called president, the deporter in chief, is my former boss, someone who's like a sister to me. So that, that wasn't easy. Um, 
but it, it's also, I knew going in that, that I would live with that tension, that the, as a, I'm an immigration policy expert, I knew when I went into the administration at some level, no matter what we did with immigration enforcement, I was gonna own it. And that's a very uncomfortable issue in my community. I did it because I was certain, and I turned out to be right, that the president was gonna be making good decisions. So immigration enforcement, in fact, did go up, um, uh, deportations from, of folks in the interior because Congress allocates the money for that and, and the, you know, DHS's job is to spend that money. Like that would have happened no matter who was president. What we did do was put in a set of priorities so that instead of treating all 11 million people who were deportable as if they were the same, we made an effort to work with the agency, the law enforcement agency, in this case DHS, to focus their energy and attention on folks that, that pose some kind of risk as opposed to other folks who don't. And we actually, it took, it clearly, it took too long. We, the agency was too tentative. All of those criticisms are true. But we got there, and we got there in a way that was tremendously impactful, all of which has been undone since, badly undone um, since then. Um, and what people came at me with was, you know, we, we, you are suspect now because you are involved in, in, in enforcing the law. And my response to that was, I'm a government official. I swore an oath to uphold the law. Um, and you need people who know what I know from all of my experience in the advocacy community. You need people like me to be willing to go into government and help make decisions about how the law is going to be enforced, even when it's a broken law that you don't like. And if people like me stay pure and stay out of government, somebody else is going to be making those decisions who doesn't know what I know. And, and how do we move forward that way? So I, I'm comfortable with that. Now, those meetings where like, people who were like my family were sitting in the room, and I was sitting next to the president, and it was uncomfortable. Like, those were painful meetings. Um, but he understood. Like, he was an organizer, right? So, you, of course, you need advocates. You need people to be in your face. You need people holding your feet to the fire. That's the essence of how a democracy is supposed to work. But it works best when people understand themselves to be part of the same team, playing different positions, right? So their job is to keep us honest. Our job is to listen, but also to let them know what, our, what the legal constraints are. Um, and, and when it works well, it's an extraordinary thing. But you have to be able to um, have conversations with people who disagree with you on some stuff because on other stuff, they may agree with you, and you might be able to move the ball a few, a few yards. And President Obama used to say all the time, you go into government to make things better. And if you, if you stop because they can't be perfect, then you're making a mistake. And he would say all the time, he would say, I'll take better every time. We're not going to get to perfect. But if we can get to better, I'll take that. And he's right. Not like yeah, no. Yeah, and, and maybe they shouldn't all been there okay and it's okay and you're not going to like everybody but as we mature and we're able to see the world just a little bit differently not through the eyes of a you know i'm going to use myself as an example of a 20 year old or a 30 I, mean, I grew on the air you know i started out as a young reporter and by the time i retired I was old enough, I probably raised, I don't know how many generations of kids who don't hesitate to tell me, I grew up watching you on TV. And I'm like, <laughs> but you know what? It's a compliment. And did everybody that watched that night believe everything that I said or liked everything that I said? No. And it's okay, but when I was younger, it hurt. It's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to live tomorrow? You know, how am I going to get over this? And then I had to understand, that's not my job. Did you have a question back there? Yeah, please, you know. Okay, so it's got to go. Uh, hi, my name is Luis Orozco. I'm a second year undergrad that's studying at the Ross School of Business. Hi. And, hi. <laughs> and so I think the first step to addressing inequalities is they have to acknowledge them. And in conversation with my peers, I've realized that a lot of them refuse to acknowledge that there's inequalities in the world and refuse to have an open conversation about inequalities in America. 
And so many of you and myself, and I'm assuming many people here, believe in inequalities because they've experienced inequalities themselves, or have had conversations and have been able to you know, grow as a person and realize some of these things. But how would you handle having conversations with people who refuse to acknowledge those kind of things and will turn that as you being unpatriotic or use you not being appreciative of being in the, in the United States? How would you handle those conversations and trying to educate other people? Oh, that feels so relevant again today. Uh, who wants to one grab at it things, first? Yeah. So one of the things that we from Latin in this space is storytelling. Because you can debate, you know, a manifestation of something, but no one can debate your own personal story. And I, I think the best way to do that is to get a, any person to really not only talk about what they see out there, but talk about themselves and what's going on in their own journey and their history and what's their personal story and get them to listen to your personal story. And typically what you find is there are gonna be some commonalities and then there are gonna be some bends. And to talk about where those stories bend and also where they come together is actually pretty powerful. So I've been in a room where people start out, you know, uh, I had sometimes this man stand up to me and cross his arms and just, you know, he was ready for battle. And I just unarmed it because I talked about what was true and real for me. You have to be vulnerable, first of all, to break down some of those barriers. But I told my own story, and he couldn't debate that. And it also made him listen, and then we talked further and further into whatever the issue was. Uh, and uh, it's pretty powerful. So that's what I would say is, is the the there is a methodology around how storytelling can be affirming and actual build trusting relationships. And I think that's the only, that's the only thing that I've seen to work well. But don't let anybody suggest that being critical means being ungrateful of being an American, right? And so this experience happens sometimes when people, you know, one thing when you have last names like ours, people don't necessarily assume that you're from this place. That comes into question a lot. Um, but ultimately, it is questioning what goes on in this country and working to make it better is a fundamentally patriotic act. And don't, like, don't, don't give an inch on that question. I, um, I'm Belinda Tucker from UCLA, went here for graduate school. And what I've appreciated most about this panel, I think, is your stories of personal evolution. I mean, you've all had really interesting and unique journeys, but how you've developed strategies over the years, uh, you know, how you dealt with things then versus how you deal with things now, you know, they're terribly useful, and I don't think we hear enough of them. So I'm going to suggest that maybe you package these kinds of stories, you know, in some kind of, you know, accessible form. Uh, I mean, I mean, great that you all went to the University of Michigan. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I recently got, you know, some kind of uh, publication from the University of Michigan. It had little narratives of people in there that I found very compelling. But, you know, this is, an, I mean, you're all incredibly accomplished. And... For people to just, you know, see that, you know, obviously your paths were not straightforward, but you've learned something over the years, you're successful, uh, and, the, and, the, and the path can be different. You're in like a Ford School podcast idea right there. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, um, was going to go down a very similar road, so I, I build on uh, Belinda's question. I'm David Lamb from ISR, which was... Um, also in the vein of sort of advice for young people choosing these, you know, making decisions, what do they do when they graduate, what do they, uh, what do, they do when they face these uh, different uh, position, potential things they could be doing. Uh, Cecilia, you said it's not, you know, good to choose a good boss, um, but, you know, what if you don't have that choice? <laughs> what, what if you, you know, you've got some options after you graduate, they're not quite perfect, uh, the bosses aren't quite perfect, which most of them aren't probably. Um, and maybe they're not necessarily the path that 
you know, you want to have an impact on society, but, you know, your option is to work for McKinsey or do something else. Um, not that McKinsey doesn't make a positive contribution to society, but... Um, so I just wonder if you could reflect on kind of those kinds of... Uh, those kinds of things, these sort of, you know, wh where do you go? How do you, how do you make these decisions uh, uh, to, to try to end up uh, having an impact? And, you know, you don't immediately get invited to serve President Obama. And maybe you get invited to serve some other president that's not President Obama, which is the same kind of a question, I guess, of, uh, as Cecilia, I think as you eloquently put it, you know, somebody's in there making those uh, decisions. What if you get invited to s serve in an administration? You're not so crazy about at a level that isn't quite what you hope for. Yeah, um, Car Carmen said something which really resonated with me that I think about a lot. I've given a lot of career advice lately because everyone I worked with was moving on in last January. So we've had, I've had a lot of conversations, especially with younger colleagues, along these very lines. Um, and I think it's really, really important to find a way to be true to who you think you are. Lejeune talked about she had a plan and her, like the plan turned out differently than she had anticipated, but it sounds like you were being true to yourself, which is how you found the courage to go in a different direction. I think of, um, and any young person that I have given career counseling to will laugh when I say this, because I say the same thing every time. I think of it as a continuum. If, if what you want to do is make a difference, for example, there are a bunch of places on the continuum you can do it. You can be an advocate and an organizer. You can work in government. You could go to law school. You could, you could do it in the corporate world. Like There's lots and lots of places. The key is figuring out where you belong, where your voice is strongest, where you feel like you fit and you're really going to... I think of it like if you're a violin string, where are you going to be the most in tune, like at your core? Because that's where you're going to be successful. People come to me and ask, you know, like I, I'm thinking about making this move and it seems like the right credential to have on my resume in order to go in the direction that I want to go. And I tend to discourage people from getting the right credential and to go with what, what are you, is going to make you wake up in the morning feeling pretty good about what you do? Um, because... As somebody who hires people, I can spot those people. They, sh they shine, right? And the person who's like, all right, I'm going to work at this place because it's like I feel like I need a few years' experience doing this thing, and then I'll move on to something else. If they're not in love with it, then it, it, that shows too. So understanding that you may not be presented with an array of options, all of which you know, make your heart sing, but it, it matters to be looking for things that are true to where you think you belong on that continuum. And you may find out, I thought I was, I was my, I started my career thinking, I am destined for direct service. I'm going to work at an organization that has clients. And I did that initially, and I was bad at it. <laughs> but I, I discovered my voice as an advocate, and my course changed too. So you have to be willing to listen to what your life is telling you, but it, but I just think if you're trying to be true to yourself, that is, um, is that sets you on a path where you are most likely to shine. <laughs> <laughs> I would say on the, on the back end of that, what I, when I try to give career advice, I think of trying to free young people up from this belief that there's a perfect, right? That, um, that there's more than one of us, right? I mean, like. Hardy at 30 was not the same Hardy at 40, who's not the same Hardy at 46. And, um, and they've all been different incarnations with lots of missteps along the way, thankfully. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I, I try to steal a page from design theorists, right? Technologists, you know, they design a mouse and they have three buttons on it and they put it out there and they go get feedback from Cecilia and says, well, why doesn't it oh, I have three buttons? It's awkward to use. And then they do it again and then they do it again. And so I, I think there's something, if you can think of life in that sort of manner, I try to tell younger people that it frees you up from going, I got to get the perfect job. I mean, just this week, I heard from a Michigan, a recent Michigan undergrad uh, graduate who I met earlier this year, and she has a fellowship in Pittsburgh and has been there for three months. And she says, I need to get out because it's not perfect. And my, and my response was, call me. Right? I mean, <laughs> it, because it's okay if it's not perfect. It's not you're invariably going to learn something about yourself in that process. I think if we can try to free younger people up from this belief that you got to get it right, because I, I suspect not many of us have got it right the first time around, and we're probably better off because we didn't get it right the first time. Don't be afraid of failing. Failure breeds success. You learn by 
picking yourself up and you find out who you really are, you know, if everything goes so smoothly and they think you're wonderful and, you know, you don't have anything to fall back on, you know, then you think that that's the way life is and we all know that it's not that way. And we've all failed at something. But finding something that you love to do every single day, whether you're paid or not, will separate you from the people who feel, you know, compelled to follow a plan or a pattern or, or whatever than those who let the opportunities find them too. And I would just add, um, when I tell people I've been at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation for 30 years, young people laugh at me. And well, because they say, what, you started when you were four? I mean, like, <laughs> they're like, who works <laughs> for 30 years? They're thinking two, maybe three. And, and sometimes I have a conversation with them about growth within. And, and there's something character building about meeting a challenge in a place and, and working through it and getting to the other side, that building that perseverance and that character and that safe relationship that you begin to know. And, you know, I could say there were many times when I thought, oh my God, uh, I gotta get out of here. Um, and at one point when I had many opportunities and I looked at these places, they were worse than the one I was in. <laughs> uh, and they weren't as enlightened. Uh, they just obvious, they really were not. And so there's something about a journey that you choose and it's inward as much as it is that employer. And sometimes I think a person has to think about what are you, what are you learning through this and what might be that longer term perspective than that short term reward that some people uh, are driven toward. Wonderful. Oh. Well, that's close to time. I, I got to start with sort of a, a silly, you know, three word. And so I'm going to start with a, you know, end with a, a really serious question, which is all of us as U of M graduates in different, different decades, different times. Um, what was your favorite thing, favorite restaurant, favorite thing to eat when you were a student here at U of M? Do you remember? I still eat here. <laughs> when I come back. In fact, I'm on my way there now. <laughs> <laughs> it's when Red I, Hawk right there on, on Stage Street. When I was a student, yeah. okay, when I was a student, uh, every Friday, uh, the Charcoal House, every Friday on Stage Street, yeah. And then I would buy myself something like for making it through another week, like a magazine or something <laughs> like that, you know? Um, yeah. Bob's. Bob's. Bob's is still open, right? Yeah. 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 A chapati? Yeah, the chapati. Oh. And a malt. And I, when I came back to the Ford School, I did a sabbatical here a few years ago. And of course, it's right across the street. And I went and I got the same thing that I always got as a student, <laughs> which is a chapati and a malt. I was appalled at how much food that is. <laughs> You're like, how did I ever? <laughs> I can't believe I could get all that food down when I was a student. But I did. <laughs> Lejeune, what was it? Flimpy burger. Flimpies, yeah. sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, Thanks, hearty. What was yours? Uh, uh, mine was um, University Cafe, a Korean place um, over by Rick's. Sure, so sure. Spicy just reminded me of Haiti, and it was just, it was pretty awesome. Uh, well, thank you all for sharing so much about, about your lives and your really incredible journeys from the University of Michigan before that and after. It was really, it was an honor to get to hear all your answers, so thank you. And thank you to all of you, Susan Collins, Dean, Director, thank you so much for, for having us. So I just, just to close things out, um, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for moderating. Of course. And for the insights and especially the candor, yeah. um, we do have it recorded. And I know a number of folks have been watching us online. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see at least some of you tomorrow as well. This was wonderful. So please join me in a round of applause mm. to our moderator. Oh, <laughs> yes.